The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. You guys have already talked about affordances, right? Or done that. Um, constraints are sort of the, uh, the, the twin evil brother of affordances because they allow us to limit what people can do. So they provide cues on how can I pick the right action in a particular situation because certain things are being kept away from me. I can't do them. You know, an affordance says, use this object in the following way. A constraint will make you avoid certain ways of using an object that the designer doesn't want you to use. And that also reduces the amount of information you need to remember because if something isn't available to choose, I don't need to remember that this would not be the right thing to do. There are various different ways of, of doing constraints. Again, physical ones, semantic, logical, cultural. I'll go through some examples here. Uh, that's the easiest way to understand those. The first one, physical, basically means we rely upon the physical properties um, to constrain the actions that are possible. Um, and I'm sorry, 10 years ago, one of our PhD students decided to uh, slice up my, my image and use them for puzzle pieces, and we never got around to changing those. Um, so, for example, if you take those two puzzle pieces, eh, that's not going to match, right? If you can't put them together. Um, so, an exa another example would be you take a traditional key, you know, one with a, with a little thing at the end, um, and you try to put that into a modern security lock, you'll see that that will never work, right? So you don't even need to try that key. If you've got 10 keys, you're not, never going to try that key in the lock because obviously it won't fit. That also means that uh, constraints only really work well if you can see them ahead of time. Um, I don't want to pull anything out here because I'm probably going to blow up stuff, but I might have an example. Um, you know, my, uh, my little USB key here, USB drive, um, guess what? It does have a constraint. It only fits one way, but it's really hard to see because USB decided to make perfectly square um, plugs. And has anybody possibly ever in their life put a USB plug in the wrong way? Yeah? Right? Like a gazillion times? <laughs> right. Especially if you can't see. It's like, it's nerve wracking, right? Um, so a good design would be, you know, you take something like a, a, a VGA plug, <coughs> which actually has a triangular shape, you know, or, or trapezoid shape, and there is immediately, immediately obvious, you can even feel it if you can't see the connector at the back, you can kind of feel the way that it needs to fit. Or you make the plug so that it will actually work both ways. Like, you know, for example, the lightning connector on a, on a, on a modern, uh, whatever, Apple iPhone, or uh, our good old, um, mains adapter power plug, right? That also fits both ways. We don't need to think about it. So um, it makes definitely sense to uh, to have um, to have things that either work both ways and then also you know fit both ways and work both ways, or have them fit only one way, but then also make it clear. Uh, one of the, the the most evil designs I've ever seen was a car key. I think it was for a Renault car. Um, where you could put the car key into the uh, lock both ways. You could actually insert it both ways. But once it was in there, you would find out whether it was the right way or not, right? because it would only work if you put it in one way. It's nerve wracking. Um, OK, uh, here's another example of a uh, physical constraint. Uh, so somebody put a sign here, do not turn this light off. We were running an experiment, and we were not uh, supposed to turn off our lights. And um, what you can't quite see here is there is a metal uh, wedge beneath this, which will actually physically keep you from turning off that light, right? That's a physical constraint in place. I think we're doing a load test of, of running a Kinect camera in our, in our space. Um, semantic constraints are, even if the things fit physically, you know, if you don't have a physical constraint, Unless I have a very strange um, you know, beauty operation, that's not how I look, and that's not how people look. So that doesn't make sense, right? It's, it, it's physically possible, but it doesn't make sense. That's what a semantic constraint basically tells you. 
Norman has the example, if you buy a plane model construction kit and you build a little plane model and then there's a, like a, a, a pilot's figurine in there, you're not gonna put him in looking backwards, right? Unless he is R2-D2 and operating some guns or something. He's gonna look forward, right? So he's gonna look out the, the front of the plane, hopefully. So, because it makes sense. Um, however, unlike physical constraints, those semantic constraints can quickly start becoming culture specific. You know, so there may be cases where they don't apply to your uh, population that you're developing for. Also, uh, I should probably also say, uh, as our understanding of the world, our meanings in the world that we can make sense of continue to change and evolve, uh, there are reasons why some things might stop making sense in the future. I mean, um, Maybe not a perfect example for a semantic constraint, but the fact that save operations are sometimes still visualized as floppy disks is like, you know, who's ever had a floppy disk in their hand these days? Right? So there is, there's definitely uh, things that are moving forward. Logical constraints. Um, uh, very close to semantic constraints, sometimes hard to tell apart. Um, this is an example where you say, <coughs> all right, uh, there is one gap missing and Obviously, it's like logically clear that there has to be another piece that needs to go there. Or if you have this plain model construction kit, uh, again, that Norman talks about, you would expect to have to use all parts, right? That's a logical constraint that would guide your design or your, your operation, what you're doing, your task. Or performing a task in obvious order, one, two, three, in a sequence. Oftentimes, natural mappings actually employ those logical constraints. For example, um, if the left switch is for the left lamp and the right switch is for the right lamp, that is both a natural mapping but also sort of a logical constraint. So you can look at it from both ways, from, from the side of um, how does it intuitively make sense or what does it uh, sort of constrain me to do. But as you can see, physical constraints are the ones that are the, the hardest, where I, I physically cannot get beyond them. Um, the others are more like guidance, right? They indicate what to do. Cultural constraints um, rely on generally accepted cultural standards to constrain your possible actions. For example, if you get a package uh, that is labeled, um, you, would expect the lab and you would expect the labels to be up, not to be upside down, which kind of implies where up would be on that package. Even if you cannot read the labels, if they're like in Italian or something, as long as you can recognize the script and you can tell which way the, uh, the writing would be upside, you know, uh, the right side up, that would help you to indicate this. So if you were to get something that only had, you know, if, if you're like, say, you're from Germany and you get something that only has labels in Chinese, uh, you couldn't tell which way would be up on that, right? Unless you happen to be able to read Chinese characters. Uh, red equals stop is another one of those cultural constraints that we already talked about earlier. Um, like I said, only applies to specific cultural groups. Um, and this, by the way, uh, is one of the key problems of, of universal design, right? Trying to um, design something that works across all cultures. I mean, when, when uh, Microsoft created the Windows Explorer and created these little yellow file folders, um, or you know, Apple did this with their, with their Mac interface, those were folders that are in universal use across the US but nobody in Europe had been using them. So uh, people actually here in Europe don't have quite the same obvious connotation with these yellow folders as people do in the US. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.